completion of the review and rankings, COT develops three reports for the board to consider in its formulation of the statewide capital improvement plans. One, number one, all fund sources, capital IT project listing. Number two, general fund sources, high value projects. And number three, other projects that specifically enable the Commonwealth to achieve its strategic goals. That is projects deemed important, but fell short mathematically of receiving a high value designation. These three reports have been submitted. A panel of eight scorers was convened. Seven scorers were IT professionals from five cabinets and one score from the budget office. They reviewed 22 projects totaling 197 million. I can't see if they are presenting slides there in the committee room, are they? We are not presenting your slides yet. If you have slides, you can share your screen and then we'll be able okay. to see. Okay, we'll do that now, thank you. If you could zoom that up to fill the screen, we'd appreciate that because our screens aren't amazingly huge. How does that appear on your screen now? Any bigger is better, but we can okay. take what we got. We do have um, slides. I don't think that's not in, that may not be in our, we have a slide presentation in our packets, but I don't, I, I recognize that. Okay, I think we're ready for the next slide, Carrie, please. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we've covered that. I'm, I'm sorry about that delay there. Okay, uh, the, the scoring criteria was prepared by COT and then scores weighted the criteria. I'm not sure if you can see all, can you see the whole slide? So 78% for the business value and 22% for risk. So the higher the business value and the lower the risk, the higher the score in total. I'm not sure if you guys can see those. Business value of service improvement, improved quality of life for citizens, business case and justification, external requirement, strategic alignment with governor's initiatives, five-year total cost of ownership, cost savings. And then the risk factors, sensitivity of data, total impl implementation costs, complexity of solution, implementation plan, and availability of skill sets. Next slide, please. This, this slide is a quick overview of the scoring process. Agencies submitted detailed information supportive of the criteria. They made oral presentations from which the panel scored the projects. The scores were tabulated and where there were any material variances amongst the scores, the panel reviewed the criteria and the project details to ensure the scores had a good understanding and were given the opportunity to adjust their scores if needed. Next slide, please, Carrie. This chart is a summary of all 22 projects by cabinet and by funding source. Again, totaling $197 million. Next slide, please. This, uh, this bar chart lists all the projects by ranking high to low, and the light blue in the bar is the business value score, and the dark blue is the risk score. And this slide particularly are the, are the top 12, I believe. And Carrie, if you go to the next slide, are the lower rankings. So the rankings went from 75 to 35. There were no really material breaks anywhere in the scoring. And of course, the scoring is, is relative to, to each other. And then finally, as part of the uh, CIO report, are the projects deemed important, but fell short of high value designation through the scoring process. There are two enterprise focused uh, projects here, the hybrid cloud and EMARS. Uh, 
the cloud, COT is looking at potential cost savings in moving certain functions to the cloud. Our first focus is on disaster recovery. Um, and this project would fund those efforts. And EMARS is a, is a moder modernization need for the accounting and financial reporting system of the enterprise. And also on the list, um, we listed the Kentucky Regional Optical Network request for routing hardware and firewalls. And we thought it, it worked well to, to leverage uh, a larger related investment. Again, I think it's fair to say that the ranking's relative. It's not to say that not all the projects have merit, but uh, the, the process takes it through to uh, a very deliberate process to rank them. And uh, that is my report. Did you have anything else to add beyond that or, or are you ready to take questions? I'm sorry, we're ready to take questions. Sure, I have an initial question. We just heard the report that the finance cabinet had changed their um, scope of project on the EMARS upgrade. Sounds like it was nine million and they're changing it to 14. Is your office looking at that rescoring or how is that gonna fit in to the overall scheme here? Carrier, David, either one, were you either one involved in the, I, I, I have to tell you, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I definitely can get you an answer if Carrie and David don't hear today. Uh, I do not have an answer to that one. I don't either. And we, we can certainly put that on the follow-up list if you all can maybe um, let us know the updates on that. I imagine the scope change and the cost change may change some of the factors and perhaps adjust the overall score of importance accordingly. Do any other members have any questions for our COT group? Seeing none, we will thank you so much for your presentation. I appreciate getting a little bit of a detail on how you're sorting these things out, and we like having your perspective um, on an overall enterprise look as each cabinet puts in their various pieces. We can see how they fit together. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. We will now move to our review of the agency capital plan, starting with Department of Military Affairs who is here with us, and we have General Lamberton and company. So if you're welcome to bring anyone forward, General Adams, good to see you as well. If you all would introduce yourselves on the record and proceed as you wish. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it as I figure out the technology in front of me just so I can make sure that we're communicating well with you. Just to, to kind of build the, the framework of the Department of Military Affairs, which I believe, as you all are aware, ties into the National Guard here into the state. In our organization, we've got roughly about 8,300 airmen, soldiers, state employees, and federal employees, so, so quite a few different categories that make up the, the organization and, and across all of this. We're spread out across 54 armories throughout the state, three training areas, an air base that's up in uh, Louisville next or adjacent to Stanford Field. As you're probably aware, our Boone National Guard Center headquarters here in Frankfurt. And so we very much keep ourselves gainfully employed and busy. And one of the things I wanted to point out as we get into some of the uh, capital projects that are either ongoing or conceptual or proposed is that keep in mind that the bulk of the, the resources and primarily um, addressing monies that come to us comes to us from federal sources. Uh, the, the majority of projects that, that we engage with, that they're, they're typically a matching component uh, the, the usual percentage, say, is 75% federal monies, 25% state monies. Sometimes it's a 50-50 uh, 
uh, mixture of what goes into the, these projects. But but the neat aspect that I'm striving to, to, to share with you is that we're kind of a, a magnet, if you will, to bring in money from outside of the state and not so heavily rely on just state monies for any type of uh, a project that we engage with. On the, uh, the first slides can, let's see. Wanted to share that. I'm seeing it in front of me. I wanna make sure that you all can see it as well. You're entirely out of my league, so we'll let we'll let staff help us with the slides. Okay. It should be sharing. David Carter, are you with us? The question is whether he's sharing a screen. I don't think he is. It doesn't look like he's sharing a screen. This is Senator Wheeler. I, it's not showing up on my on our remote um, presentation on Zoom. Senator Southward, Representative McCool, did you all have a hard copy by any chance? I have not seen a PowerPoint copy of your show. Let's see. I could take a oh. Yeah, Apologize, I'm being told it's in my packet. Oh. In mind. Got some notes on it. If you've got it there, terrific, ma'am. If not, we can give you one of our copies. Go ahead and proceed. I think we have, if members all have their copies, we can follow along and hopefully we can get our audience on board quickly. Okay, terrific. It's the Boy Scout in me that says be prepared for all contingencies. Uh, the, the first slide there, if, if you've got it in front of you for, for yourselves and anybody who's listening in virtually, it, it gives the overview of the, the funding source for our capital. Sorry, I'm going to get it to share for you. Okay. Pardon me as I've got somebody smarter than me helping me out with this. Perfect. Sorry, now you just, where were you? The first, um, back up. No, oh, I can use the mouse okay. still, right? Okay, we're improving all the time. All right, the, the first slide is I started to get into it. And, and uh, let me introduce uh, Brigadier General Retired Ben Adams. General Adams is the executive director for the Department of Military Affairs. So he's virtually my right-hand man and, and one of the, the many quality folks that we get to work with, not only in DMA, but also the, the National Guard. So now that, that we're up on our IT world, the first slide presenting to you shows the, uh, the capital plan, the, the general funding sources, and, and uh, across each of those sources, when I mention or refer to the general fund, those will be monies that we're looking to get from just the state. Pretty much each of the other sources up there, and in particular, I draw your attention to both the federal funds and the other long-term funding or financing that, that we receive. That's the, the bulk of the overall project capitalization that we're going to be dealing with. So, so just like I alluded to, the, uh, the matching between federal and state resources, as you can see, just total by these numbers, uh, the bulk of the, uh, the financial resources coming to us is both from federal and, in some cases, private entities. From there, I'll go to the, the, the four primary priorities that, that we've got and also addressing the, the source of these fundings in particular. As I mentioned to go uh, across the state, we've got 54 armories, uh, three training sites, our headquarters, an air base, 
and uh, the bulk of our facilities average about 40 years in age. We, we got some of the armories that are 70 plus years old. So, so what I'm leading up to there is that a number of our structures of which we've got 375 across the entire state are old and getting older. And, and so as that implies, there's the, uh, there's the maintenance, the, the upkeep, the installation of new wiring, new plumbing, and, and that's pretty much the, the biggest expense that we look to state resources to assist us with. As I mentioned, the, the, the federal state match that we receive that money for the most part goes towards new construction, but it does not go towards the maintenance of all of the buildings that we've got. And, and that's uh, effectively where we need to tap into um, uh, state monies to help us keep up to the buildings and uh, the subsequent upgrade. So, so the, the first item up there, the, the Armory Installation Facility Maintenance Pool, that's the highest dollar item that we've got to address with general funds and again specifically to the state resources themselves. The, the next item that we've got on there, some of you all may have heard of it, but we're in the, the process of construction of a, a new readiness center, or, or that's quite simply, if you will, a new term for the armories that we've got in Somerset, Kentucky. And, and this is a project that is done in conjunction with the economic development activities out of Somerset and Pulaski County, and it's really kind of a cornerstone of their economic development plan. So it's quite simply a benefit to both the immediate city in Somerset and to our benefit to provide our soldiers with a, a brand new armory and facility there. And one of the neat things that you all may or may not be aware of but with the geographic dispersal of our armories uh, across the state, in some places it very much is a cornerstone for a lot of civic or social activity in the community. So it becomes kind of a, a social center as well. It can be rented out to local organizations. And what I'm getting to there, it's another source of funding that helps us maintain these facilities as we move forward. But, but this is still a conceptual plan right now where we're dealing with, uh, as I mentioned, the, the local civic entities. We're dealing with state entities and federal entities towards the, uh, the production of the new readiness center in Somerset. The, the next item that I, I've got up there addresses the youth challenge programs that we've got in Kentucky. This is unique to the, the guard and the, the guard only. You won't see these programs in any other component of the military, any other branch of the military, but basically it serves at-risk youth and high school age kids who, who for whatever reason have issues with their, their high school education, maybe in some cases their, their family situations and, and just the economic viability around them or circumstances. So what we offer them through two youth challenge academies that we've got, one is in Fort Knox, the other one's in Harlan, Kentucky, is to bring these kids in and provide a controlled 24 seven environment, which quite simply offers in a number of cases, a more secure environment, a better living standard, and still we're addressing the, the academic situation because we, through these two U Challenge Academies, are, are able to continue their education, whether it's towards, in some cases, a high school diploma, some other cases, a, a GED, or, or just transition to the workforce subsequent to completion of the, their time at the academy or high school graduation. This is another program, as I previously mentioned, is also a federal state match, 75% federal monies, 25% state monies going into the, the operation of it, the, the payroll of it. But again, the maintenance of the structures, the upkeep of the buildings themselves, this is where we've got to solely rely on state monies towards that end. And, and thus the, uh, the $2 million that you see requested up there. The, the final item uh, of these big four, if you will, that I've got listed there, the, the modernization pool, quite simply, this is the 
upgrade, not just uh, the maintenance, but the upgrade of our facilities. For example, as I mentioned a little bit ago, that some of our, our structures are as old as 70 or more years. And so things such as HVAC wasn't in existence when some of these buildings were first put together. So, so we literally are installing HVAC systems. Our National Guard force, when some of these buildings were initially constructed, literally were predominantly males. There wasn't the, the male-female mix that we've got of soldiers and airmen today. So, so that implies upgrading the facilities to accommodate uh, showers for both genders, to accommodate the latrines for both genders. And because these are older structures, that's a, a little bit more expensive proposition. But, but it's that type of modernization or upgrade of the, uh, the older structures in particular that I'm addressing. And again, if you look at the, uh, the other categories in the slide here, from the, the total budget to the general funds to the other funds, again, the, the bottom line there, you see where each one of these four priorities culminates with uh, an amount in excess of $41 million. But look over to the, the, the right, and you'll see the federal funds make up the, the bulk of what's going to address each one of those priorities. I'm going to go ahead and to my next slide. I just, as I'd already mentioned with you, our geographic dispersion across the state, you know, that is a number of us drive by the, the Boone National Guard headquarters here in Frankfurt on a daily basis and with your respective districts and many others, the presence is statewide, literally from the far east to the far western part of the state. Next, I'm going to skip over to, we've got 28 projects here that do not require general funds, but, but to show you some of the, uh, the priority items that we're looking at and give you some sense of where they are and the, the purpose or our focus for where it benefits the Department of Military Affairs or the, the Kentucky National Guard. On this particular slide, the, the first, third, and fifth items, those are projects that are conceptually being worked through to enhance our Bluegrass Station. Bluegrass Station, if you're not familiar with it, it it's close to Winchester, Kentucky. It's state property, but it's state property that has several tenant activities that are located there and actually serve other DOD facilities and organizations and uh, actually bring in a profit through Bluegrass Station itself. But, but as many of the other aspects I've already shared with you, it is an older facility. It in itself requires constant upgrades through its funding. The, uh, the second item on here from the, uh, the facility maintenance pool at Bluegrass Station. That's a, a funding item that we anticipate addressing completely on our own, not, uh, as already mentioned, requiring any sort of uh, assistance from the state funding with this. And, and some of the subsequent items that we've got here, looking down that, that page to the uh, uh, field maintenance shop at Bowman Field up in Louisville, to the other maintenance shops at the, the bottom of the page. Th those are likewise facilities that enable us to simply manage and maintain, if not upgrade, the, the fleet of vehicles and other pieces of equipment we've got in the guard. Well, one thing I, I wanna draw your attention to is uh, the, uh, the fourth from the, the bottom of the page there, chargeable housing at the Wendell H. Ford Regional Training Facility. The Wendell H. Ford facility is the, the largest training site that we've got in the, the National Guard here in the, the state of Kentucky. The, this has grown over the, the years. It's not only primarily the training site that, that we in the Kentucky National Guard go to, but it draws other entities from the, the military, for example, Fort Campbell, other military entities from outside the state law enforcement entities, uh, firefighting entities, and whenever anybody other than the, the guard trains there, they pay us a fee to do so. 
So, so quite simply, as we're able to construct further housing there, these other organizations I'm referring to pay for the use of that housing in addition to the training area. So that's another means of also bringing in money to help us be self-sustaining with some of the uh, sites that we've got throughout the, the state. The, uh, the, the next page, and, and I am uh, wrapping up, so I'm striving to stay to my uh, time limit with this. Uh, other projects that we've got here are similar in scope from new facilities. Uh, the, uh, the one other item from the third down from the top of the page there that addresses the Harold H. Disney training site, which is actually in Artemis, Kentucky. Uh, another type of upgrade, as I mentioned, whereas we upgrade the athletic field and we're also looking to upgrade the facilities there, it tends to draw in more units and more non-Kentucky Guard type of entities. And once again, these entities pay for the, the use of the facility, which helps us to, to be self-sustaining again. Uh, one other item that I'll draw your attention to, it's really not so much pertinent to, to this body, but it very much is to us in the Guard, is the construction of a machine gun range. Now, now I don't anticipate anybody uh, else in this room getting out there unless you want to. We can work that out for you. But um, I'm sorry? Okay. Ben, mark that down. Representative McCool, Machine Gun Range, Future Training Day. just accepted the invitations. Day. Committee will be taking a field trip. <laughs> uh, we are making note of that. Um, but, but I want to get to there. This is a, a machine gun range to be built at the, uh, the Wendell H. Ford training site. And because that's a training site we own, control, run, manage, it simply benefits the, the readiness of our units. Now, there, there are machine gun ranges on Fort Knox, but uh, unfortunately find that that's often in conflict for our scheduling because we're in conflict with other entities for those ranges, and quite simply, it presents a fair amount of training friction from our perspective. The, uh, the final page on here, some of the, these programs from the, the additional uh, hangars proposed for uh, bluegrass stations, that those, as the, uh, the fund source indicates, that would be from one of the tenant organizations that we currently have there. The, uh, the, the extension of utilities at Wiffer Ticket, again, that's enhancing that facility, not only for our own use, but to draw other entities. And then the, the final item kind of lumped together, the, the last couple of projects that we've got identified there is involving the, the use of solar powers or solar panels that, that we've got already in place on a number of structures. And actually, we, the, the Kentucky National Guard, your Kentucky National Guard, ha has received national recognition for the energy savings that, that we've had as a result of it. So, so again, it's kind of a self-sustaining program that projects us in even better financial status and moving ahead. So simply striving to expand that dynamic. And ma'am, sir, and anybody else listening in at this junction, that really concludes the information I've got to share with you subject to your all's questions. Thank you. I do have a number of questions um, as we went through this. I wanted to get a better handle. For example, Bluegrass Station looks like there are some upgrades and changes and then other new projects per se. And are any of these, I mean, are, are these all standalone? Or I mean, if we get property, but we can't build the buildings, you know, like how do they tie together where we really have to have these two in a set or these three in a set? Can you maybe point those out if those exist? Certainly. Like, for example, I'm going back to the, the first page of uh, some of these specific projects and specifically looking at the acquisition of property, uh, upgrading the uh, the electric, upgrading the uh, the roadway around. This is part of uh, an enhancement project that has several facets to it, and I've broken it down there to give you a sense of each one of the uh, the the monetary portions to that. 
but it's basically to draw additional tenant activities to Bluegrass Station and basically make it a more profitable entity. So, so as you, you correctly pointed out there, there, there are several sub-projects there that address everything from upgrading the facility, acquisition of land uh, around Bluegrass Station, and, and that acquisition primarily goes into or completely goes into Bourbon County and, and to, to the subsequent construction of new facilities itself. All, all this is still conceptual at this point. The, the various parties that would be engaged with it uh, quite simply are still working through it at this junction. Okay, so to be clear, I think the acquisition of property, the electric, the sewer, and the road improvements, you're saying, are all kind of part of the one big expansion project. Correct. And the runway and the hangars are kind of a separate thing? Well, the, the runway is also a portion of that. And I lump all of those together because those are one funding source broken down by the components to it. The, the hangars, that is an anticipated project subsequent to this construction that would be entirely engaged by one of the tenant activities, if that makes sense. So, so there's a separation primarily by the funding source, although they're interrelated. Okay, and where's the landfill? Is that? Currently, we've got one there, but for the proposed runway that, that we're working through at this junction, it would interfere with that runway. So quite simply, it has to be moved. Okay, so if we do the runway project, then we have to do the landfill project because it's going to be a problem. Correct. Okay, so, and perhaps, is this all in the detailed committee plans that I haven't looked at apparently, or do we need to make, I'd like to kind of get a list because it's hard for when we look at these projects, they're sorted out one at a time, and we kind of need to see them in sets to say, well, there's no point in, we can't do... The runway if we don't fix the landfill you know like right. these contingencies do we have that already laid out somewhere or can we get that we have some proposals way? uh to, to to be straightforward with you all of this lumps together and what is being constructed as a p3 project but but uh, i emphasize the word constructed because the level of detail isn't there yet so so uh, what I can share with you here is the, the detail that we projected on our own, but this is going to involve input from other organizations that, quite simply, I don't have yet. Okay, sure, and I understand that. Um, moving on to the uh, maintenance, we were talking about maintenance and then trouble with state funds and federal funds not being able to be used for the buildings. So, for example, we have the civil support team facility addition here. And it says the unit at present is an undersized building, and we're talking about getting a new building. So what are we using the old building for? Is it going to, how do you balance building more new stuff and then always trying to scramble together more state-only funds to keep up with all these buildings? Sure. The, the, the civil support team, if, uh, if you're not familiar with it, basically that, that's our response unit to dealing with hazardous materials. And in particular, it, it often works with uh, first responding units, uh, uh, EOD type units, explosive ordnance units, often at the engagement of some of the local law enforcement around. And whenever there's any type of a hazardous material type of environment that they call upon our civil support team to engage with them and make an assessment of the situation before first responders would go in to, uh, to whatever the incident may be. Currently, they're adjacent to the airfield that's, or the air base that's up in Louisville, which is adjacent to Stanford Field. They are occupying buildings that had previously been designed for other functional purposes, and quite simply, that they're confined in those buildings. That They've got more equipment and more personnel than quite simply can be housed where they are. So what we propose is to relocate them to Boone Center, where quite simply we've got more room for them to, to spread out and can construct the, the types of facilities that are pertinent to their functional purpose 
as opposed to having crammed them in t into a, another older facility well before the, the unit was ever designed. So to be clear, the building at Stanford Field is ours or we're leasing it? It's ours. Okay, and we have a use for it or we're gonna lease it out or well, we don't know? It, it's, it's been used by various functions of the air wing that it's adjacent to right now. And, and so likewise, as we formed the CST up there, the air wing had to crunch down, if you will, into the, their current facilities. So, so it, it's folks who are in a more confined environment that, that's not conducive to what the function is of either element, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, there was another one I caught here that the uh, Let's see here, the Burlington Maintenance Shop uh, said we were going to build a new one to replace the lease shop. So can you give us an idea, or is that somewhere in our notes, the amount of the lease? So we're just trying to get an idea of, you know, cost effectiveness, buy versus lease. It's the age-old question. Uh, 48000 Go ahead. Ma'am, uh, when we built Burlington Armory, we, we basically obtained uh, an additional uh, acreage that we were going to put the field maintenance shop in. At the time, we, we still had to find the federal funding for it. So it's always been a placeholder for that. And the, the type of uh, equipment that uh, the field maintenance shop currently uses in that leased area is, is, uh, has overgrown that ability to support it. So this is, it's a natural occurrence and we definitely wanna uh, get rid of what lease property that we do currently maintain, which is few. But this is uh, an ongoing project to basically upgrade all of our field maintenance shops across the state. Okay, thank you. Um, and my final question was about the energy efficiency. We're talking about the solar panels. Has there been a study, I'm assuming on the utility costs, estimated savings, if we do these solar panels, do we have those numbers? We don't have them immediately available to us, so yeah. we can share that with you. Okay. We can provide that, that ma'am. That would be great. And, and, Fantastic. Do other members have questions on any of these items? Representative McCool. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation today. I'm an old Marine and, and, uh, and, and Kentucky Air National Guard as well, so I thank you for, for your presentation today. Just want to make sure on some of this stuff, is most of this non-recurring cost? Because uh, I see possibly some of it's recurring cost too. Do you have that divided between the two? Because recurring every every session, well, every budget year, we're going to have to budget for this. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the the maintenance pool is a recurring cost. We constantly go back each biennium to to ask for a set number of dollars to to help match and and provide some of the maintenance to these older buildings. Uh, I think part of our our struggle is we ask for more than what we actually get, uh, and we're going to again ask for as. It's shown on this slide the, the eight million dollars. Typically, we only get about a million, million and a half that we can use each year. So it it is a, a struggle to keep up because we certainly have opportunity to gain more federal dollars, but we certainly can't do things with it because we don't have a state match. Yeah, I agree. We don't want to let those federal dollars. We want to capture those if we can. I uh, understand. Yes, sir. That. And and so. that's that's where we need your support and as you have done in the past. Uh, to kind of help champion that for us uh, for this next biennium. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. One more follow-up. When you mentioned the other long-term financing, you mentioned federal and private, and I wanted to get an idea. I think we were lumping federal funds and long-term financing together when you made that comment, but can you give us an idea, other than the federal funds, the 2575s or the 5050s, we're getting, I'm thinking this restricted funds total is bluegrass station proceeds or is, 
other restrictive funds and then where the long-term financing is coming from and how we how that workflow is going I got gotcha. you. Okay. Great. Do we have any other questions? We've got somebody's lost their sound. I, I don't think we're frozen. Are we frozen on Zoom? Yeah, I could hear you. I just couldn't hear what the presenter said. That's fine. I just want to make sure. Oh, okay. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for your service and your presentation. We appreciate it. And thank you, um, thank you your team you. as well, for pulling all these things together for us. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Super bye. Our next presenters will be the Department of Veterans Affairs, who are also in person with us. So we welcome you all to the table. Um, we've got Commissioner Jackson and others. Please, when you take your seats, uh, make sure your microphones are on. You can introduce to each other and proceed as you see fit. Can you hear me now? Okay, sorry about that. Yes, sir. <laughs> Senator Southworth, Representative McCool, thank you for having Kentucky Department of Veterans Affairs today to present to you. With me, I have uh, Deputy Commissioner Whitney Allen, uh, Executive Director of uh, Veterans Centers, Mark Bowman, who's behind the pole there. Uh, we have uh, his deputy, Martha Workman. Uh, we have the um, our budget analyst, budget manager, Stephanie Belt, and Presenting uh, with me today is Alvin Duncan, who is our Executive Director of Veterans Services and uh, Cemeteries. So with that, we'll begin. This is KDVA at a glance uh, with our nursing centers, uh, um, which Mark oversees. Uh, we have four across the state, uh, and they represent from Central Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky, Western Kentucky, um, and are um, pretty highly rated across the country as, one, as some of the best. Uh, our cemeteries, which Al runs, um, is five uh, across the state, and they are uh, significantly uh, uh, awarded also. Uh, he does a great job of, of ensuring that our veterans are taken care of as, as far as the, uh, the final life stage and the families are um, um, professionally taken care of. Um, and this is an overview of what we do with our state programs from benefits, the Homeless Women's Veterans Program, uh, the Homeless Veterans Program, the Women's Veterans Program, and our Kentucky Veterans Program. When we get into our request, 
uh, at $6.7 million. Um, the general fund request is 3.7, and, and uh, you can read that for yourself. Um, and when we look at the more important part is what we're, what we're asking uh, reference that is to 1.6 for our, our maintenance pool, uh, Western Kentucky Veterans Center uh, at 2.1 million, and the raise and realignment uh, for our cemeteries, um, which is a federally funded event. Uh, when we look at how we uh, developed our work through our process for uh, bringing these uh, projects to you, uh, we based it on three areas. One was safety of our personnel and veterans, uh, federal, state, and local guidelines, and then need requirement and lifespan. And so that led us to uh, the projects that we bring before you today. When we look at our maintenance pool, uh, it's pretty much uh, self self reporting when it comes to, uh, you know, we are 24 hours, seven day a week operation. Uh, and um, these things are, uh, or these items and that we take care of um, are uh, life sustaining and, 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 and the safety aspect is, is what we focus on. So these are the supporting uh, references and documents that go with um, while we are, are you asking for the $1.6 million for the maintenance pool? With the heating and cooling system, that goes with the, the number one uh, in, our, in our overall uh, screening criteria when we talked about safety. Um, and the replacement of two, to the two cooling towers, um, we're at the, we're at the life expectancy of 20 years. And, uh, and I think it's uh, one of the more important aspects of as we move forward of taking care of our veterans. And, and that's the safety aspect. And then when you start talking about the, um, uh, the uh, federal and state guidelines that say that we have to produce these things to protect our veterans in our veteran centers, it's uh, uh, very important that we identify these and present them to you for support and funding. And these are the, uh, the supporting documents that, uh, that allow us to move forward with that request. The raise and realignment, and like I said, that's more of a federal funding. Uh, it is a federal funding, and I'll let Al talk to that if you have any questions in reference to that at the end of our presentation. But uh, it, it, uh, it allows us to, um, to bring our uh, cemeteries uh, or cemetery this in particular um, um, in Radcliffe, Kentucky, up to the standard that uh, that we've always maintained for our uh, our facilities um, across the board. So, and uh, once again, this is our criteria that we uh, that we utilize to uh, to support our request. And with that, we'll open up for questions, ma'am. Thank you. I have a couple questions. One on the heating and cooling one. You said there are 19 and 20 years now, and we're talking about a capital plan that would go into effect next year. So let's say one of them bites the dust tomorrow. What, what do we do? <laughs> if, if it bites the dust now, um, I'll let Mark come up and answer that question. Thank you if you don't mind. And I'll, I'll kneel while I talk. So that's the whole purpose for this. We're trying to get ahead of that curve at the bottom line. It's so essential uh, to the, the safety and the comfort of our veterans and the regulatory requirements. We would have to do an emergency request to re repair. And if we had restricted funds available, we would have to access to get it done. Because um, as the commissioner stated, uh, we the most important issue is our veterans, but we do have a regulatory component that requires temperatures within a certain degree or a certain range. And if not, if we can't fix it right away, we would have to transport or keep them out of those areas. So uh, we're trying to get ahead of the curve, and um, we are we've uh, we've been conservative 
and to make sure that we do it the right way. And uh, I spoke with a maintenance branch manager yesterday, and, and these are getting ready to start having problems. Uh, but the bottom line, we would have to replace it right away, no matter uh, in whatever capacity or whatever way we could. Stay right there for my follow up because, <laughs> yeah, you know, I feel like I've got 10 years out of extra on my 10 year roof. So I'm yeah. wondering if we do these funds next year and the maintenance guys keep looking at them and go, well, I mean, I think we've got another year. I think we've got another two years. And you, you go at it. Or we, how is the fixing plan going? Is it let's fix them now because we don't know when they're going to go or we kind of watch them go and the money is sitting there ready for you when you need it? It's, it's really a preventive measure because in the past what's happened when we've waited too late and we go into an emergency repair, uh, it tends to skyrocket the cost because of rentals for equipment to keep us in uh, compliance and our veterans safe. So uh, it would be nice to be able to have that extended lookout period. But in the state system, as you probably know, once you start in a project, and it will take a little while to establish that due to the RFP and the contract and the planning. So we're to get it going and actually bring it to fruition uh, is a little bit further out. But that's a good question. We, but once we go, we need to go and get that fixed so we don't incur those emergency costs when it does go. Okay, we've got somebody who can't hear. Hang on just a second. Okay. Supposedly we have no sound from the presenters, but I can hear them just fine. So um, we'll have somebody in here to fix that. Is this one better? Or well, I mean, I can hear it, but um, we'll find out from our Zoom crowd if they can hear it okay i've got one other question about the cemeteries um it says we're doing the grant's going to cover eight of the 14 sections yes ma'am is that because the grant is a flat dollar amount or because we only need to fix eight sections or tell me how we're picking these eight compared to all the different needs out there the way the national cemetery administration and state cemetery grants program works is they will come back in, and basically those eight have been completed. They will only give us the money to go back and do the raising ring line in sections that have been completed. Everyone has uh, been buried in that section. All the headstones are set. So they don't work in a, in a section that is continuing operations. So eight of the 14 sections are already been completed at KBCC. So once those other sections get done, then we'll come back in a later time and do the rest of those sections. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for that explanation. Are we back on with the microphones? We're checking. Okay, does anybody else have any other questions? Looks like with no further questions, you all are off the hook. Thank you so much <laughs> right. Thank for you, your presentation. Thank you. And our next presenters are going to be the Kentucky Communications Network Authority. We have uh, Jamie Link will be presenting for KCNA. Jamie, if you can find your way to the... Hold on a second. We need to get our screen share. If we could have staff also clear the screen when they get a chance. Jamie can come forward and... Uh, Introduce yourself. We will get if you have a PowerPoint. Let's check. I'm appearing virtually, Madam Chair. Is there a PowerPoint that we need to have? Yes, I will share my screen whenever you're ready. Okay, fantastic. And you will proceed after that. No problem. Thank you. Great. Uh, and again, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, we thank you for the opportunity to come and present uh, the Kentucky Communications Network Authorities six-year capital plan, and uh, we very much appreciate, uh, as a former member of this board, uh, appreciate the, the mission of the board and the, the challenge for allocating uh, very limited state resources. So uh, I will move quickly through our presentation, but first wanted to introduce uh, KCNA staff that will be appearing with me to help address any questions that the board members might have. Uh, with me are Mike Hayden, our Chief Operating Officer, Doug Hendricks, our General Counsel and Legislative Liaison, and Mitch Powers, who is our Chief Network Engineer. 
So I will now share our presentation. And can everyone see that okay? Fantastic looking. Okay. Let's see, my screen went blank. There we are. Okay, is that all right? Back on perfectly, thank you. Very good. Well, I apologize. It appears you're at the end of your show, so perhaps scroll up the first slide. I thought I had it set up and I, I did not, so here we are. Okay, so um, the, the map I have in front of you right now shows that the fiber construction of the Kentucky Wired Network is now uh, 98, uh, actually at this point, 98 plus percent completed. That is depicted by the green lines on the state map before you. Uh, you will notice some yellow lines, uh, particularly in Western Kentucky and up around the, the Fort Knox area, uh, just south of Louisville uh, and Hardin and Meade counties um, that are currently underway and should be completed within the next um, 90 to 120 days. Uh, you will also notice some uh, blue circles on the map with uh, numerical designations. Those depict the various rings of the Kentucky Wired Network, and there are six total rings. And the reason it is structured that way is to provide redundancy across the network. So in the event of a, uh, a vehicle accident, an ice storm, anything that might affect a, a cable across the state, uh, the light that carries the data will reroute and go backwards so that anyone in that area will experience very little, if any, outage uh, because of the redundancy that's built into the network. So just a brief overview of the uh, Kentucky Wired project, and, and I'm sure uh, most members and, and most uh, attendees here are familiar with the project, but it is a 3,300 mile uh, fiber optic cable network that is built all across the state. Uh, and I would use a, an analogy of an interstate highway. Uh, if you remember the green lines, the, the interstate highway runs all across the state and we have exit ramps, if you will, or access points in every county in Kentucky, all 120 counties. So this network will provide access to every citizen in these counties and particularly the focus is on uh, rural and underserved areas. Uh, the Kentucky Wired Network is a middle mile network, uh, again, that interstate analogy, but it also allows for local internet service providers in your communities back home to now access this middle mile uh, or backbone that has previously not been available to them in most areas of our state. Uh, KCNA will also provide last mile service uh, to state government offices, uh, the public universities, community colleges, and, and other public customers as the, uh, the network develops uh, in the future. Uh, another part component of the, the project is that when the, the network was built, it was built um, basically double the capacity of what was needed for state government because the cost effectiveness when you're, when you're installing cable you can install uh, a larger cable or a smaller cable and it's gonna cost about the same money. So the Commonwealth elected to install a larger cable uh, that would allow approximately 50% spare capacity. And by doing that, the Commonwealth is able to monetize that spare capacity through a wholesale partner that can provide service to those local internet service providers. And by virtue of doing that, the Commonwealth will realize a minimum 75% revenue share of the net revenues generated by that wholesale business. Uh, in addition, uh, because we are providing uh, service to state agencies, instead of those state agencies paying a, a large telecommunications company or a legacy provider, those monies will now stay within the state coffers. And combining those direct state agency services as well as the wholesale revenue uh, those monies will be dedicated to pay for this network. Uh, and Kentucky, I would point out, is the first state in the nation uh, to build a statewide open access fiber optic network that touches every county in that state. 
we all know that, that since 2015, the Commonwealth has invested millions of dollars in this network. And uh, potentially in the future, uh, we anticipate this project through the wholesale component and through the direct services from KCNA will serve uh, hundreds of thousands and, and potentially millions of customers over the next 30 years. Uh, again, being the first state to, to have a network uh, of this, um, this size and capacity. Uh, but as we all know, technology advances every day, every month, every year. And as technology advances, uh, the equipment uh, that makes the network work uh, changes and improves. And because we're going to have such uh, a need for this network for so many users, it is imperative that we keep the network operating at peak efficiency uh, so that those customers have the best service they can possibly have. And, and our, our six-year capital plan addresses not only the equipment refresh, as we call it, uh, but also enhancements to the network that will help us expand its capacity over the next six years covered in this six-year capital plan. Uh, to date, we have already migrated 135 state agencies, uh, primarily in the Golden Triangle of the Commonwealth, which is ring 1A, if you remember the map. Uh, and all 135 agencies have um, reported that their service has been vastly improved. Uh, they're not waiting for services. They don't have the outages that they used to have. Uh, and uh, it allows them to service their customers, uh, whether it be uh, health and family services or a driver's license office, any state agency service uh, can now be provided more efficiently and effectively. Uh, a little history, uh, in 2017, Kentucky was ranked 47th in the country for broadband speeds. Uh, but after, uh, with the advent of the Kentucky Wired Network, we anticipate that Kentucky will move into the top 10 nationally and um, that certainly bodes well for our ability, not only in, in the areas of economic development and education, but also in healthcare, public safety, and, and general quality of life issues. Again, uh, for, for the, the state's rural and underserved areas that have, have not had this opportunity before because of the lack of infrastructure. And uh, I would contend that uh, broadband service today is, is similar to uh, water, electricity, sewer. Uh, it's now basic infrastructure in today's world. Um, uh, I've already mentioned that this middle mile network will allow the local internet service providers to, to now tap into this, this uh, current infrastructure that they haven't had before. And I think I believe we would all agree that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic certainly um, highlighted the critical need for broadband services, uh, you know, with, with school children having to uh, do remote learning uh, from businesses, uh, for employees who had to work remotely. Uh, the need for broadband services has skyrocketed. Uh, I mentioned the, the various uh, important areas that broadband serves. Uh, from economic development to healthcare and public safety and education. Um, and over the six year period of this request, and, and I'll get to that slide in just a second, uh, you'll see what we project to be the need uh, to upgrade the equipment and to enhance the network to keep it operating at peak level and servicing as many customers as, as possible. Uh, regarding the equipment refresh, uh, we will work with Commonwealth Office of Technology to analyze and determine what equipment is needed, when it is needed, and where it is needed in order to keep the, the network working at, at peak efficiency. And regarding the network enhancements, as more and more customers come onto the network, uh, we feel like the, as that demand is going to grow exponentially. And thus, we will need to enhance the network or build out in various areas that aren't already built in order to accommodate that growing need. Uh, and again, I mentioned earlier about the redundancy and flexibility to minimize any outage that any customers on the network uh, might have. Um, I mentioned the, the monies will stay in the state coffers as well as the 75% the plus revenue share. Um, and I don't wanna be redundant. Um, 
And, and lastly, I'll mention that uh, as, as the members of the General Assembly who are on the, on the board, as well as others, that the governor and General Assembly, uh, I believe, recognized how, how critical broadband service is now. And uh, they created the $300 million uh, broadband deployment fund. And that being a 50% matching fund, uh, that potentially puts $600 million out there to uh, start addressing those last mile uh, broadband needs of, of our citizens and our businesses. So you will see uh, for fiscal 22 through fiscal 28, uh, the period covered in the six year capital plan, uh, we anticipate refreshing the equipment over these next six years will be approximately $44 million with seven and a half million dollars in the upcoming 22 to 24 biennium. Uh, and these were estimates that were determined by our technical staff as well as our best estimates of what the industry is, is showing right now. And uh, this will not create any additional operating costs for KCNA. Uh, this is just to replace the equipment as technology advances. Uh, regarding the enhancement of the network uh, for the six year period covered in this plan, uh, we anticipate uh, about $7 million will be needed to build out in various new areas across the state as demand grows. Uh, and regarding that additional infrastructure build out, we anticipate over this period, it could be about $600,000 in additional operating costs in order to maintain and keep the network operating at peak efficiency. So with that, uh, I've, I've sped through this, hopefully in a timely manner, uh, but we're uh, standing by to take any questions the, the members may have. Thank you. Um... I might take the words out of some other's mouths, but um, what exactly has the lifetime cost been for this whole project from start to finish? Do we have a, a lifetime to date figure? I believe the capitalized cost and, and Madam Chair, our, our CFO, uh, our Chief Financial Officer, Steve Murphy, had a medical appointment and couldn't join us today, but we will we will confirm that number with you. But I believe the capitalized cost of the project right now is about $360 million. Okay. And um, to be clear, I think we have a vendor that we were working with. And I'm trying to get a handle on what these capital funds for enhancements and building out new portions, how is that, com how is that fitting into the mm -hmm. initial build out that I think we were using a vendor for, but clarify to me, I might be behind. Okay, if I understand correctly, for, for this six year capital plan, any new equipment purchases, uh, those will be procured through existing contracts or through competitive uh, procurement methods, uh, working with finance and administration cabinet, as well as any enhancements, uh, whether if, it's, if it regards any construction activities, uh, we will competitively procure those services because the initial contract with the the vendor that you mentioned uh, will be concluding. It, it, did I answer that? Does that make sense? You, you probably did, but I think I'm going to have to ask another question because I'm not entirely okay. clear. Um, Certainly. So the public-private partnership that we have, they have put in how much money and how is this six million or I'm looking specifically right now at this $2 million for Kentucky Wired Network Enhancements, 22 through 24. And there's, you yes. mentioned, I mean, you essentially have two, two things you want here. And one is the continued operation, the other is additional enhancements. So how does that connect to the P3 project or the so, arrangement that we have with them? Are they doing this and this is our piece of this or, or is there going to be more no. money later? No, th this would be an enhancement of the, the, of the core network uh, that uh, there was an original scope and that, that's what has been built and, and will be completed in, in the next two to three months. Uh, so anything additional would be based upon demand in, in different areas of the state as more and more customers uh, come online. We may have to build out uh, some additional cable infrastructure to reach uh, those areas and provide the, the network connection or access points uh, that will allow bringing on uh, those additional additional customers. Uh, and then, of course, if, if we need to work with our wholesale partner to 
get service out to uh, local ISPs. Uh, that could be a component of this. Uh, and I'd also ask our chief network engineer, Mitch Powers, if he has anything to add regarding the network enhancement. It's the items you mentioned, Jamie, as well as, you know, again, just any enhancements where we've, we've noted that uh, we've got a potential risk or, or redundancy issue that we could improve. Um, so we've got a couple of those slated where we have, you know, a, lo a, a large amount of traffic on a single path, um, you know, picking up uh, agency traffic from counties. Uh, we want to look at, at making sure that we've got redundancy on that path is, is one example of one of the projects. Okay, thank you. Um, Senator Wheeler. Um, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I guess I kind of have a two-part question, if I might be permitted, Madam Chairwoman. Go for it. Uh, you know, I've been a supporter of Kentucky Wired. I think it's essential that we get, um, you know, broadband service to rural areas. Uh, I think that is uh, imperative, especially the pandemic has shown us that. But what was the original cost estimate to, to I guess, set up the initial, um, I guess, to use some of the terminology I've heard, first mile to the actual governmental centers? I believe, and, and I'd ask my colleagues to jump in uh, as needed, I believe the original estimate was around $250 million. And then in the early stages of the project, uh, there was um, a need to enter into poll attachment agreements all across the state. I forget, there were tens of thousands, if not 100, hundreds of thousands of polls uh, to which uh, poll attachment agreements were required. And that resulted in the additional cost of, of about $93 million or so. Okay. And I apologize. I may have a little bit of a technical difficulty myself <laughs> here in rural Eastern Kentucky, but what did you think the initial figure was prior to the poll attachments? I think the initial figure and, 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 and Senator uh, Wheeler will, will confirm that with you in your office, uh, I believe is around $250 million and then about $93 million for the poll attachments. And then through the, the, the construction of the project, uh, as you can imagine, with any construction project, there have been uh, a few change orders and things to meet unforeseen needs that occurred over the last few years. Uh, and that gets us up to about the $360 million that has been spent to date. Well, I, I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, like the poll attachments themselves, I mean, that seemed to would seem to me something that would have been quite obvious if you intended to use the uh, the telephone poles to uh, to do these types of things that uh, you know you would have had to have had some agreements up front with the telephone uh, companies and that this should have been factored into the initial estimates when this was approved. Has there been any look at getting some of the people that came up with this additional idea to, to look at possibly negligence actions against them to recover some of these cost overruns? Uh, Senator Wheeler, uh Yes. To, to answer your question, uh, we are re-examining everything we possibly can to see if there are any additional efficiencies we can can find in the project. Obviously, it's a it's a massive project with with statewide coverage. Uh, but you're right. Um, we we want to look and and see if there's anything that that we can do to get a better value or or any recovery uh, regarding the initial cost of the project. And I believe that. Uh, uh, my colleagues were, were have a long history with this project and, and perhaps our, our general counsel or our chief operating officer might uh, want to uh, provide some additional information. Okay. Uh, yeah, if anybody chime in, I'd be happy to listen. Yeah, this is Doug Hendricks. I'm the general counsel. And I can tell you that uh, over the life of the project, we've had a number of, of disputes and issues that have come up with our contractor. And we have if, uh, we spend a lot of our time working to drive those costs down. So, and we're always looking at, at any issue that, uh, that we might be able to find to uh, recover any costs that would be available to the Commonwealth. Well, well what costs have been recovered? We haven't recovered any specific costs. There's no, no, been, no money that's come directly to us, but what we have done is uh, been able to drive down additional payments. So like the additional payment that Jamie was speaking of, 
that was part of a settlement that the Bevin administration reached. And there was a uh, significant negotiation on, on working on getting that number as low as possible for the Commonwealth. Okay. But I mean, like I said, let's just call them the, uh, I don't want to use necessarily, the term has some pejoratives, but you know, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and use it. The guilty parties that kind of got us into this quagmire, what efforts have been made to recover for the taxpayers from these folks that have, you know, essentially caused a lot of the, the, the hiccups along the way with the advancement of this project? We haven't initiated any civil actions or contract claims or anything like that, specifically against the, uh, the parties that were involved in the initial uh, Okay. I guess my follow-up would be then, why not? We've been working to deal mainly with our contractors that we have now. The way this is set up, we had a uh, Macquarie Infrastructures who brought this deal to us. And we have subcontract, they have contracted out the work that's been done on that. And that's who we've been dealing with is where the where the rubber meets the road on getting the work actually done. Wait, so is Macquarie Infrastructure, was this the ones that initially came up with the project estimates and the timeline and all of this? That was the entity that was awarded the contract back in 2014, yes. Are they still involved? Uh, they have a, they created a special purpose vehicle, an LLC called Kentucky Wired Operations Company. That That is the prime contractor for this project. Okay. And I guess my question would be, given the, 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 the you know, supreme amount of problems. And again, I support the ultimate goal here why the heck would you still have these people involved after they have shown themselves, you know, incompetent in many ways in managing this project? Well, that's, you know, it's a difficult question. You know, uh, contract actions are difficult, as you know, I mean, to prove somebody's in breach of contract. So, you know, our focus has been, and I'm speaking for the executive team here, our focus has been on trying to get it built and as quickly and as cheaply as possible. But we're always looking to see if there's any issue where we might try to find a recovery. I mean, but, you know, I'm also speaking as a lawyer that, you know, is, is somebody that does a lot of negligence actions. That's what I do. I'm a, you know, a plaintiff attorney. I mean, you know, negligence generally has a one year statute of limitations. So I would think something would need to be done. I mean, I guess theoretically a breach of contract action, you might have 10 or 15 years, depending on when the, the contract was initiated. But you know, one of the other things they always want you to show is whether or not you mitigated your damages. And that's going to be pretty tough when you continue to do business with somebody, even after they've done all these things. Just and, and, conditioner. No, and, and you're right, Senator. And, and we are constantly looking at any opportunities we have to protect the Commonwealth's interests. Uh, that's an ongoing process. Uh, and, and there are contractual processes regarding disputes and referees that, that we have employed. Uh, and I, it's probably not appropriate for me to discuss in, in this forum, uh, but uh, I can assure you that we are looking at everything we possibly can to mitigate uh, the expense to the taxpayers of the Commonwealth, as well as to build and deliver uh, a world-class fiber optic network. All right. Madam Chairwoman, I believe that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wanted to get clarity on um, the payments. You said we got a settlement that we were able to get the payments worked way down. Can you give me an idea of what these payments, how much they are? Doug, I think you were talking about the, the, the poll attachment of the settlement there and, and how we worked that cost down. Yeah, that was the $93 million settlement. That's how much uh, we agreed to pay extra for that issue. Okay, so we're paying that in an installment plan, the $93 million? Is that what you mean? I believe that's already been paid, but I may be wrong about that. We can confirm that. For you. Okay, so maybe it's been paid lump sum. I'm trying to get a handle on this 30-year plan with McQuery um, to support the operation and maintenance. I, my understanding was we're in a 30-year contract with them. Is that true? That's correct. This and, contract runs through 2045. And what are our payments for that? We just make the general availability payment that we make every year. That uh... so, so, Madam Madam Chair, in in the KCNA budget, the availability component that was uh, approved by the General Assembly in the in the 2021 session 
uh, and in the 2020 session is approximately $32 million a year that, that goes to pay uh, for the debt service uh, component of the project. And then, along with other contractual obligations. And then for your all's office, are you all funded through the general fund or how are you or your office funded? Yes, ma'am. We're, we're funded through the general fund at, at, at current. Uh, but as I mentioned in the presentation, our, our ultimate goal is that uh, this project uh, through the, the service to state agencies, as well as the wholesale component of the project and the, reven the net revenue share, is that uh, the revenues generated by the project will fund the, the bulk of KCNA's annual operating budget. And that will take some time, obviously, because the network is, is just now getting up and running. But that, that has always been the intention, is that this project, uh, through providing service, will generate the revenue necessary to fund uh, the vast majority, if not all, of the operating costs. And then do we have an idea of how much money our agencies have not spent on other services because they've transferred over to the Kentucky Wired? Uh, I don't have that information definitively right now, but we can certainly work on that and get that back to your office. Okay, that would be good. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions? Looks like we do not have any further questions at this time. Thank you all for your report and for the answer so far, and we'll look forward to the other answers coming. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Have a wonderful day. We are up next. We have our uh, Kentucky Infrastructure Authority presenting. Deputy Executive Director Sandy Williams and team, if you all will introduce yourselves and proceed. Thank you, Senator Southworth, Representative McCool and members of the board. I'm Sandy Williams, Deputy Executive Director of the Kentucky Infrastructure Authority. And with me today is Maylee Sun, KIA's Treasurer and Fiscal Officer. The Kentucky Infrastructure Authority is presenting its six-year capital plan, requesting a total of 179 million $628,000 for each biennium consisting of general, federal, and agency funds. Um, I'd like to give you a brief overview of KIA. The authority provides financing for infrastructure projects, primarily drinking water and wastewater for governmental agencies, and broadband deployment financing for governmental agencies and private entities. Currently, we have four loan programs and two grant programs. And we hope to uh, be able to adopt a new federally assisted grant program in the upcoming biennium. Starting with our loan programs, we have two federally assisted loan programs, the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, we call it Fund A, and it was created in 1988 to provide financial assistance for water pollution control activities, sewer projects. Uh, the program uses existing loan repayments of principal and interest, federal grants, and state match dollars to fund local wastewater infrastructure projects across the state. We anticipate approximately $40.5 million each biennium from a federal capitalization grant through the Environmental Protection Agency, and there's a 20% state match requirement of approximately $8.1 million. Loans are provided to the governmental agencies after a thorough credit review. Borrowers are offered at or below market interest rates and additional subsidization in the form of principal forgiveness, which is available to some borrowers who qualify based on median household income and affordability index and the project's ranking. We're also requesting authorization for 30 million in agency bonds which are not considered a debt obligation of the state. And this would allow KA to expand its funding capacity in the event that loan demand exceeds fund availability. Our second federally assisted uh, loan program is the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund Program. We call it Fund F. It origin originated in 1996 
to provide financial assistance based on public health criteria outlined in the Safe Drinking Water Act. And like the Fund A program, Fund F recycles loan repayments to make new loans. Um, it also receives a federal capitalization grant. We anticipate 36.3 million each biennium from the EPA with a 20% state match requirement, approximately $7.3 million. Um, this loan, uh, this program also provides at or below market interest rates and additional subsidization uh, in the form of principal forgiveness for projects that qualify. We would also request 30 million in agency bonds for this program, again, which are not considered debt obligations of the state, which would allow KIA to expand our funding capacity in the event that loan demand exceeds fund availability. Our state funded loan program, uh, our infrastructure revolving fund, we call that Fund B, is uh, it currently has an annual lending capacity of about $5 million. We're requesting general fund support to provide uh, in the amount of 25 million to provide loan assistance to governmental agencies to detect water loss from distribution lines eliminate failing privately owned package treatment plants um, through consolidation into publicly owned utilities. The additional general fund support will increase available funding to small and disadvantaged communities, and most importantly, to economic development driven projects, which are generally not eligible under the two federally funded programs. The grant program that KI KIA hopes to implement in the upcoming biennium is the Small and Disadvantaged Communities Drinking Water Grant. It's a new federal grant program authorized by the Water Infrastructure Improvements for the Nation Act of 2016. The Kentucky allocation is 1.4 million and this, this state matches a little higher at 82% uh, or 1.1 million would be required. The purpose of this program is to provide assistance to unserved and underserved communities without household drinking water or wastewater services and to reduce violations of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Our two newest grant programs are the Broadband Deployment Fund and the Drinking Water and Wastewater Grant Program. Both were funded through General Assembly appropriations funded through the American Recovery Plan Act by the Coronavirus State Fiscal Recovery Fund. The Broadband Deployment Fund consists of 300 million of grant funding to governmental agencies and private entities to provide last mile broadband service to unserved and underserved households and businesses. And the program requires at least a 50% match from the grantees local or private funds. The drinking water and wastewater grant program consists of 250 million to governmental agencies to finance water and wastewater infrastructure projects. In summary, the general fund request would provide support for our federally assisted programs through the necessary state match and additional support for the state funded infrastructure revolving loan program, which will increase the funds long term lending capacity. The federal cap grants with related state match will support the clean water and drinking water state revolving fund programs and assistance for small and disadvantaged communities grant. And the agency leverage bonds, again, not considered obligations of the state will provide supplemental funds to the two federally funded state revolving programs if demand exceeds available funding. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today about the type of support KIA is able to provide to Kentuckians to provide necessary public services like water, wastewater, and last mile broadband infrastructure. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I want to get a clarification here on the first one, assistance for small and disadvantaged communities. You mentioned yes. the match was like 1.1 million for yes. the federal funds. So, and you're asking for 2.5. So can you explain um, this isn't just matching funds you're looking for. You're looking for something else as well. And what is that? 
Yes, ma'am. Um, the, the first part is federal funds in the amount of 1.4 million. And then it would require a state match of 1.1 million for a total of 2.5. Okay, thank you for that math. Um, and then the other uh, wastewater program you mentioned that we have that 250 million that's coming, the 78 is in addition to that for, can you explain again what the 78 million request is for? Yes. Related, I believe you said it was related to the 250 that we just got through the ARPA. Um, so those are, those are separate. Those are separate requests. Um, the, May Lee may have to help me out here. Um, um, so the, there's 40 million in uh, federal funds for the Clean Water Revolving Fund program, plus an additional 36.3 million in federal funds for the Drinking Water Revolving Fund program. Is that inside the wastewater program? Um, those are the, the two loan programs. One is for sewer and one is for drinking water. Okay, I might be um, following now. Yes, can I clarify on that? Uh, those, those are federally funded pro uh, pro uh, program. And then this cleaner water uh, program is a grants from the uh, American Rescue Plan Act. So they are, they are separate. Apologize for being um, perhaps confused. Um, so let's go over the amounts again, just so I'm clear and so our other members are clear because we've heard a lot about the drinking and wastewater from ARPA, but I'm trying to figure out what on here is not ARPA and if anything overlapping or because you mentioned the ARPA funds, but I think these are additional funds and none of these are overlapping. And if any of them are overlapping, then please point out which ones are. You are, you are correct. The, the budget request does not include the ARPA funds. So there is no overlap with ARPA. Um, it was my understanding that the, the ARPA funds are in this were appropriated during this biennium. And so we would, we were, I believe, told not to include those in the request uh, because those were not new requests, they were existing requests. I just spoke about them um, just to, to let the committee know or the, the board know it, it was another activity at KIA. Okay, so to be clear, these requests for the Federal Assisted Wastewater Program and the Drinking Water are the normal existing programs that KIA has been doing for years and where ARPA might come in tangentially, it's really not the same thing. It's not like we're adding new funds to the same type of program. These are just enhancing the existing programs we used to always have. Is that correct? You are correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I think I'm better on track here. Do any other members have any other questions? looks like you scored and knocked it out of the park. Nobody has any other questions. So thank you so much for being here and presenting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next uh, presenter will be the Tourism Arts and Heritage Cabinet, Chris Reese, Executive Director. Welcome, Chris, and please introduce yourself and um, let us know. I don't think we have a PowerPoint, do we? You do not have a PowerPoint, okay, and, uh, great. And, but we can we can make it simple. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm Chris Reese. I'm the executive director for the Office of Finance for the Tourism Arts and Heritage Cabinet. And I have with me today Will I. Adams, who's uh, deputy commissioner for the Department of Parks, and Lincoln Farmer, who is the uh, director of facilities for the Department of Parks to answer any parks related questions that may, become, may come up. Uh, I do not have a uh, PowerPoint with me, but uh, I do want you to use the uh, the summary and analysis uh, that your team put together uh, so well that on page five, if you flip to that, we can follow right along then and, and uh, that way you can uh, 
move along with me as we kind of run through what we have in, in front of us. And I'll be cognizant of time because I know we've uh, had a long meeting. Uh, thank you for having us and thank you for the work this, uh, this board has done in the past for, uh, for all of the agencies under the Tourism, Arts and Heritage Cabinet. Uh, we, we have a lot of capital needs. Uh, we'll try our best to address the important ones right now. Um, we have almost $500 million in the six year capital plan budget. We have 87 projects in the two year portion of it, adding up to $351 million. And I will not cover them all today. Uh, I am going to break those up into uh, to some small bite sized pieces that are gonna uh, at least help you understand where we are uh, with that. Um, specifically uh, maintenance pools. Uh, we have revenue generating uh, projects and then we have some large maintenance projects uh, because we have a whole lot of facilities and sometimes they, things get owed. Uh, I like to, to point out with most of our things relate to maintenance, which uh, comes about for three reasons, either the age of a facility, uh, the use of a facility, or the location where the facility sits. And, and uh, maintenance pools help solve those problems. And parks is a good example of that. Uh, with 45 parks, uh, 17 of them having lodges, uh, most many of them being on the National Registry of Historic Places, uh, they are uh, very old, they are visited by lots of people, and they sit out in the woods where things are damp and there are woodland creatures and stuff like that, that, you know, tree branches falling and, and things that can happen to them. Uh, so we need maintenance pools. We need maintenance pools for our facilities to take care of. We've had them in the past. I'm asking for five different maintenance pools with this request. The Department of Parks uh, currently has one and they're asking for one for $17.28 million to to keep the things that break daily from remaining broken and, and to fix them. Uh, the Department of, I mean, the Kentucky Horse Park is the second one we're asking for. Uh, that's a 1200 acre facility. It is not only a working horse farm, but it is also an event venue and it is also a campground and it is also a tourist stop uh, with museums and, and, and such. Uh, so it has a, uh, a need the, to spread over that 1200 acres uh, you know, one and a half million dollars a year isn't, isn't a lot. It, it cover, it's a 30 year old facility. Uh, so things get old and, and need to be repaired and we need to put our best face forward. Um, I have a new request and this, uh, a new maintenance pool that I'm, I'm going to ask for in this request is, uh, the Artisan Center at Berea. Uh, many of us know that facility right along the interstate, uh, that, promotes artisans throughout the state uh, in a place where uh, it gets a lot of traffic. That building is now 18 years old, which is newer as far as old buildings go. But, you know, think about your home. If you had 18 year old things, uh, they have a roof that when it rains, you have to put about, you know, half dozen to a dozen buckets out right in the middle of the, the lobby to, to catch the rainwater that's dripping. Uh, they have what was at one time green wood on the outside of the building, which is now sun bleached and, and gray and starting to rot that needs to be addressed. Uh, they have AC units that are constantly going down. So when they have 300 plus tour buses scheduled to come by every year and those people walk in the door, they're not wanting to visit Kentucky. Uh, they may get 80 degrees and in, in humid outside. They don't want it to be 80 degrees and humid inside. Uh, so we need to, to address those. So I am, we are asking for a, uh, a, maintenance pool to be created uh, to address those needs before they, they get out of hand. Um, uh, Kentucky Performing Arts, uh, that facility, obviously has had some recent renovations done to it, uh, but because of fire, but it doesn't address uh, the day-to-day the -day maintenance of, of old pipes that create old leaks and things of that nature. So uh, it, it gets used heavily and, and hopefully will be used heavily here by this fall now that we're reopening. Uh, and then the last one of the, is, is the, a big one of the bunch, the Kentucky State Fair Board. Uh, they're looking for a $6 million maintenance pool, $3 million a year to help maintain their million plus square feet under roof at the Kentucky State, uh, at the Kentucky Exposition Center, plus the new facility at the International Convention Center uh, that, that we all know get used uh, so heavily with, uh, with so many different uh, things, you know, vehicles and animals and people moving throughout the facility. So maintenance pools is number one. Uh, and, and we hope that, uh, that you all can see the, the need that we have for that. Uh, number two is 
we're kind of unique at the tourism cabinet and the fact that we get to, to sell the nice things that the state has to offer, the, the vistas and such. Uh, and some of those things that we have can generate a, a return on investment. So you put capital in and you, you get revenue out. Uh, the big one that I want to talk about today is campgrounds. Uh, before COVID, campgrounds were a growing, trending upward. Uh, everyone wants to go camping. During COVID, uh, uh, and if you ask uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Adams, it, it has helped parks a great deal to have campgrounds because uh, it's kind of carried them uh, through this part. Uh, and there's nothing to say that that trend isn't going to end. Uh, RV sales are, are higher than they've ever been, and, and we need to capitalize on that. So we are looking at the Kentucky Horse Park, which currently has a 260 site uh, campground, which is constantly booked up and constantly ranks as, a, as an excellent facility to, to be at, but like to expand. Uh, we would like to build another 100 sites on there. The, the infrastructure is already kind of in the works. It's adjacent to the current 260 sites. It's flat ground with, uh, with some utilities already running through it. Uh, so we have a request for uh, to build those sites, uh, knowing that that will have a return on its investment and therefore uh, create less of a drain on the general fund in the future, uh, because the the horse park can can live off some of that restricted fund revenue that it earn. Uh, the same way with the Department of Parks, they have a a bigger request, just shy of uh, eighteen million dollars in there, to upgrade facilities. They have a lot of campgrounds, but I think it's been mentioned in here. Uh, I, I think. Uh, uh, Mr. Link said broadband is a basic part of infrastructure now. So uh, people who drive up their RVs uh, want to have uh, Wi-Fi access. They would like to have sewer access and they would like to have uh, higher amperage so they can run all their electronic equipment at their campground. Uh, and in doing so, they will pay for that. So if we can build those things into what we have, we can, uh, uh, can charge more and, and earn a little more revenue uh, that's that's waiting there for us. Uh, so so we do have those infrastructure needs. Uh, and then the last thing I'll address today is other large projects, which kind of make up a big bulk of the 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 other eighty uh, projects that we have here. Uh, and and a significant one is the Kentucky Horse Parks uh, competition barns uh, that ranks very high on our list of priorities here. Uh, it's a $12 million upgrade, but realize that that has been on the project list uh, for the six-year capital plan for multiple years, each year moving higher and higher on the priorities because the facilities tend to de deteriorate more and more each year. And uh, you've got a lot of uh, horses that come to compete to, on that property. There are hundreds of horses at any time. Right now, there are hundreds of horses at the at the event that's going on uh, today. And uh and you've got people in that and it becomes uh, structural and dangerous. And, uh, and we need to, again, not have that be what people experience uh, when they come to Kentucky, especially when it's revolves around horses. So we are looking at, at safety concerns there that we, we want to uh, get on the front end of. Uh, Parks has multiple projects. Uh, some of those are infrastructure, which we've got to be talking about uh, sewage treatment plants have been discussed. Uh, wastewater treatment has been discussed a lot here. We've got facilities that are over 50 years old that had a 20 year lifespan. And when they're the only thing that, that uh, keeps your lodge running, you can only put so many band-aids on, you know? And so we need to address some of those uh, larger project needs that are there um, in there. And then uh, the Kentucky Performing Arts, as much as they've had added to their facility, they still have a, a 35 year old building with a facade on the front of it and, and, and paving needs uh, that need to be addressed so that they can uh, continue to bring in the, the wonderful shows that they have. Uh, the last thing I'll mention, and it's a little different than the other projects we have is we have a project that's uh, out there for the uh, Historical Society. Uh, it's just under $1.6 million, but that's not the request. That is a matched from private funds. Uh, it's almost 50-50, it's 48-52. Uh, they're asking for $819,000 worth of funding that they can match with private funds uh, to upgrade their facility too. It's, it's now getting to be dated and, and they have some museum needs uh, that if, uh, if the state can put up, uh, put, put up for uh, 52 cents, they can get 48 cents somewhere else and, and, uh, and help update their, their facility a, a great deal. 
Uh, so that is a quick version of what I have, but it'll open us up to, to questions uh, that anybody may have uh, now. Thank you. Can you just clarify where which number is that um, historic uh, match? It is, uh, it, through. it is number eight. Oh, number eight. Okay. Number, page six, bottom of page six. Thank you for that. And I mm -hmm. had a couple of questions and we'll open it up. Um, mm -hmm. For example, revenue generating project number six, I'm looking at this campground you're mentioning. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm over here doing the math. Uh, in my notes here, we've got uh, potentially 30 plus dollars per night, number of campsites, assuming 70% occupancy April through October. Probably we're... The 536000 is just a sketch of how much money you might bring in. Um, costs for employees and additional expansion costs and so forth, 165. So I took that off and I'm doing the math on a $7.75 million project. It'll take us 20 years just to hit sea level. At that you get, point, you get a, you, yeah, you're about five percent return. Is that what you're getting? Yeah. Well, I'm kind of concerned <laughs> after 20 years, we're going to have to be you know, renovating these old campsites. So mm -hmm. how, how are we doing the revenue generation? I know we've had a kind of a history of the parks being in the red. At some mm -hmm. point, I'd like to see us get in the black. I don't know it, how to do that. I, and it's, I appreciate the question because it is a good question because we're, we're reviewing some of these numbers too. The, the $7.7 .7 million pr uh, project uh, that, that starts that it was a, an old number that we're reviewing we've got to start somewhere and that's the number that we we had in the books we're looking to see if that number is accurate for because uh, we we now know that there's some infrastructure that's on that property and maybe that would reduce that figure and and increase that roi um also realize uh senator in in calculating the roi on expenses uh, we still have to calculate in the uh retirement obligation that we have the benefits obligation for because most of the operating that comes after the fact is personnel and and you know personnel costs us uh you know for every dollar we're another dollar and change in benefits uh because we're so comparing that to what a private operation would do is a little bit uh a little bit difficult um but we are looking at fine-tuning these were the the notes that your put, staff put together on there um but it is a, a legitimate question it is something that does uh it does move the needle in the right way uh that that it does generate some uh some more money coming into the state and therefore a, a re reduction on that general fund obligation in the future. Uh, but we can, we can definitely clarify with you uh, a little bit deeper uh, if you would like. Okay. The other question I had was similar number 22. We're talking mm -hmm. about security system and cameras. Now I'm not in the security, but I do know cameras. And as I calculate here, it says we're going to have 200 plus strategically placed high resolution cameras for $5 million. So that's $25,000 a piece if we weren't including system costs, just if we're piecing it out to the 200 cameras. I mean, um, I mean, it sounds like red cameras to me, but I'm trying to figure out, do we have, are these based on bids that we have? Are we just guessing or who's in the security camera industry to tell us that it's going to be $25 million for 200 cameras? I will, uh, I, I will answer a little bit, but I will get back to you with a, a, a better answer for that. Uh, I, I would assume that that number comes as an estimate from the staff at the uh, International Convention Center, the state, state fair board staff, which is familiar with, with what its security needs and has a very good uh, IT team for that. Um, but they are not here to, to represent, and I don't want to speak for them, uh, but I can follow up and, and get you more information as to how they came up with that number and... Uh, and, and what that number involves. Okay, because the key issue is, are we buying cameras or are we paying for long-term maintenance and operation? That's always that, the question. As soon yeah. as we capitalize things, then we're trying to figure out how to pay costs. Yes, Do any I, other members have any questions? Yes, Madam Chair, I have a uh, question. Uh, Go for it. If you would allow. Um, so last week, my wife and I, my daughter, we took a tour around the state and this kind of stems from a couple of years ago, uh, you know, our commitment towards the state parks and making an investment, uh, into general upkeep. And I remember as a kid, you know, traveling around the state and, and, you know, loving our state parks and went all over and, and it was something, you know, Kentucky was known for. 
Well, you know, last week we had a great time, uh, mostly spent time out in Western Kentucky, uh, went to Penny, uh, Penny Rall, uh, spent some time on the beach there, went down to Lake Barkley. Um, of course, you know, as you highlighted, you know, there was quite a bit of, of deferred maintenance and, and obviously so. Uh, I know we were trying to go to one picnic area in Lake Barkley and there was a huge oak tree laying in the middle of a parking lot. You couldn't get to it. Um, some mowing and, and, of course, buildings and, and maintenance pools in general uh, that need to be updated. So I guess my, my question and, and also to piggyback off of uh, Chair Southworth's uh, uh, question, when you're looking at maintenance pools and you are looking around the state and you're prioritizing these projects, um, what all are you looking at uh, in terms of where are we going to put our money? I'll, I'll defer that to, to Deputy Commissioner uh, Adams, I think, will maybe easier to answer. Thank you for the question, Representative Lewis. I think it, it really highlights the needs that we have at our parks. And, and you mentioned Lake Barkley in particular. In the past uh, four to five years, we've um, collectively invested about 16 or $17 million in projects there. Um, you will see on this, on this proposed list, there are equal that in projects needed at that park in particular. Um, you know, what we've really been doing is putting band-aids um, on the issues as we move forward. And we, what we really need is, is major investments. Um, the way we have prioritized our needs are starting with um, securing the structural integrity of our, of our built facilities, uh, focusing on life safety, and then as a lower priority on things where we think we can get a good return on investment. Um, you know, you won't see a lot of big uh, ribbon cutting opportunities here. What we're really looking for is just to, to get the parts back to what you remember them being. Absolutely, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions from any other members? All right, well, we thank you all so much now our Pre, just former speaker that just spoke gets the win winner of the best background award on zoom today and our uh, main speaker you get the best award for easy to digest long massive list of things i followed <laughs> everything you said and i love categorization those three ways you just did that so thank you so much for making that easy for us to digest yeah. for your team and uh, thank you for the time to talk our next and last presenters are the Transportation Cabinet. We will have Robin Brewer. If you could um, approach and hand us all the information we need. Okay, hello. Uh, I'm Robin Brewer. I'm the Executive Director of the Office of Budget and Fiscal Management in the Transportation Cabinet. Um, and I do not have a PowerPoint for you today. I'm just going to kind of give a very high level uh, overview of our uh, capital plan. We as well have a, a pretty extensive, extensively long capital plan. We have almost 70 items in our capital plan. Um, I do have several other people uh, on this call with me as well, just to, um, to help with any questions that you may have about specific projects. Um, we have folks from the Office of Support Services, Environmental Analysis, Aviation, Division of Equipment, our State Highway Engineer's Office, Information Technology, and the Division of Materials as well. <clears throat> um, so, you know, as you know, the, the Transportation Cabinet is responsible for the construction, reconstruction, and maintenance of uh, the Commonwealth's, you know, extensive transportation program. Um, and so, you know, we have approximately 4,500 employees. Um, we utilize approximately 1,400 buildings and facilities across our, all 120 uh, counties in the state. Um, so again, you know, you can imagine we have a lot of capital needs um, that come up. So um, we as well kind of put our, our capital planning categories. Um, so, so basically ours is in four primary components or categories. The first being ongoing maintenance and preservation on existing but aging buildings, uh, salt structures, rest areas, and waste stations throughout the state. 
uh, as well as minor uh, road work on our state parks grounds. So that uh, encompasses four different uh, maintenance pools that we have in our capital plan. Uh, our second category is IT. Uh, we do have one IT related item uh, in our, our capital plan and that has to do with the use of and the maintenance for our system called AsheToware. Uh, KYTC currently subscribes to the AsheToware project, bridge maintenance, safety analyst, and pavement management applications. And this project will allow the cabinet to stay current with changes in federal regulations and technology by enabling the cabinet to implement new versions of the AsheToWare software suite, suite on a regular basis. Many of these products are moving from client server base to web base, which requires a more in-depth upgrade. Uh, our third category is our construction of approximately 32 new maintenance facilities and salt structures and several district offices throughout the state to support the need to provide employees with a safe and adequate work facility. Also included is construction and replacement of several new welcome centers and rest areas across the state, as well as expanding of truck parking at some of the truck rest areas or truck rest havens to increase safety of motorists. And our fourth component is maintenance needs for our Capital City Airport and the Department of Aviation for maintenance on aging aircraft and aging airport facilities, as well as the construction of a new terminal building, various new hangars, including a new maintenance hangar, and the replacement of some outdated aircraft. So overall, um, the cabinet, cabinet's needs over the next six years total approximately 205 million in road funds, 23 million in general funds, 59 million in federal funds, and 320,000 in restricted funds. And these capital needs will continue to help the cabinet in achieving its mission to provide a safe, efficient, environmentally sound and fiscally responsible transportation system that delivers economic opportunity and enhances the quality of life in Kentucky. So that concludes my presentation and we can um, try to answer any questions you may have. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask a question about the salt storage facilities. It says we're doing con number nine, constructing regional salt structures. Then we turn around and we've got multiple different counties with salt facilities. So can you explain the difference, some of these overlapping or none of them are overlapping? Uh, yes, hopefully uh, Pat Grugan from our Office of Support Services uh, should be on the call. I'm gonna kind of defer to him on, on that. Hey Robin, uh, this is Pat Grugan. Um, the, reg the regional salt storage is, we do that just so we don't have to send our trucks to the cave in Louisville to get where the salt major salt storage is. And the, we have them on all our maintenance lots as well to buffer a little bit so we make sure we have enough salt to cover all the roads. Okay, so the regional salt structures are different than the county salt facilities? Yes, absolutely. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out if we got $2.5 million for one county salt facility, how many salt structures we can get for our 1.5? The, the 2.5 million I think you're speaking of is for a, a maintenance facility with in salt structure with that project. Yeah, that's true. Let, let me actually hook into the county maintenance facility question. So I continually have constituents asking me, you know, why, who, who, whenever they have a problem, they call the county place and they say, no, it's the state and they call the state. And nobody knows the difference uh, typically. And, and I know you all get the same questions and the counties get the same questions. So is there anybody looking at the potential of uh, perhaps having one facility and both groups kind of sharing facilities in any way? Is that possible? I don't believe that's something that we would want to entertain at this time. We, we, we want to make sure we have plenty of salt for each district. And to, I, I understand what you're saying. Could we do up or participate together to get the salt in one location? I don't, I don't think that's 
feasible to do. I've never looked at it, though. I will be honest. I've not looked at that. Well, let me back up to county maintenance, because I think most people aren't focused on the salt as much, because we just like that you get it out, and we don't necessarily know or care how fast you get it out, as long as it's extra super fast. <laughs> um, right. The county maintenance garages and things i think i've been asked a number of times so since you're here and we're talking about it, it's perfect timing um how we could if if we can why we can't um combine uh, forces whether it's some equipment we use once a year can we you know share between county and state uh share the same garage you know have one mega garage versus you know two small ones uh, those type questions I think I'd have to refer to our uh, upper management to figure that out because I don't think I could uh, make the meeting with the county people. Uh, that's something that maybe our secretary could look at doing. Sure. Just wanted to get an idea there. Um, my other yeah. question is on the uh, 16 new tea hangers, number four. Um $2 million talking about constructing 16 new tea hangers. And I think it's a fantastic idea, but I'm looking at the notes here. Um, if we do all the math, potentially our rental square footage, so forth, we might be clearing about $21,000 a year in actual net revenue. Um, now that'd take us 91 years to pay back the difference. So what actual benefit are we going to be getting other than just rentals or am I missing something? I believe we have um, Scott Shannon from uh, Capital City Airport on the call as well and he I'll, I'll defer to him to see uh, how he would like to answer that. Did we lose Mr. Shannon? Well, I, I don't know. Maybe he's having some technical difficulties. I will say, I mean, again, I would have to check with, with um, Capital City, you know, uh, to confirm this, but I believe um, some of the added benefit would just be that it probably would promote some, some economic development. Um, you know, as people fly into the state for potential meetings or uh, potentially, you know, some type of economic development opportunity, uh, they may need to, to rent those hangars uh, for those meetings. And so, you know, I'm not sure we could quantify what that value would be, but if it's an economic development opportunity, obviously it would add value. Sure. Appreciate that answer. Um, do any other members have any other questions for our transportation team? We all clear? Okie doke. Well, looks like you're ready to go. So thank you so much for your presentation, and we'll look forward to getting maybe some clarifying answers on those questions. Thank you. Thank you everybody for um, participating today. I did want to clarify if we had any members that came after our roll call, could we get them answered on the roll? We got them. Rocky Atkins. Okay, good. Just wanted to double check. Um, if we have no further business, I would make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Well, with no objection, the meeting will be adjourned. Thank you all.